fortunate today because our tour guides are right here, the Band of Steady Habits. They are going to take us on a trip through Connecticut, show us some iconic historic places, and accompany that with music. And maybe we'll begin with so many guys. Please do. <laughs> really, I mean, there are, a, there are a number of songs that you might know, and half the fun is actually singing along, so uh, don't hesitate. You will sound better than I do, sir. <laughs> and you're, you're more than welcome to. Am I as loud as I sound right here? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I want to thank also Connecticut Humanities. They really have been very generous to us. Um, with a grant to help us do this. Thanks to Connecticut Humanities, and I think we're ready to embark on our trip. Absolutely. So let us. I, I will let you know that 15 minutes ago, the bus was broken down and on the side of the road, and there was a, a fair amount of panic going on up here. If you notice the frenzy, uh, that was why. We well, all set. Our, we're all set. Thank excellent. You. Thank you so much for coming. It is, uh, I'm looking around this room and I see so many people who have done so much for history in Connecticut and there's so darn much knowledge here. You are intimidating. There's Susan Barlow and Ruthie Brown, Don Rogers, uh, and uh, anyway, I'm frightened, but uh, um, do, do, do I still sound too loud? No. Okay, good. Go to your room. I'll just check it. <laughs> so, uh, I honestly, that we're, there's a lot of improvisation going on up here. So I'm not going to promise you that we're going to have a smooth ride, but I guarantee you it's going to be interesting. So, with that in mind, and you know, you congregationalists, you know the tune. <laughs> Make ye a joyful sounding noise unto Jehovah all the earth. Serve ye Jehovah with gladness. Be the old church, our town's tallest building, lying walls of stone that frame the fields where my great-grandfather's grandfather plowed out his family's livelihood. I view those fields through rippled window panes of the house Israel and Eliezer Woodward built together in 1780, a two-story, eight-room hilltop anchor in a, uh, of stability in a time of revolution. My old single stack colonial farmhouse in Columbia and the literally thousands of historic homes like it that are treasured parts of each of our 169 towns are the storybook Connecticut. They are the foundation of the spirit and character of Connecticut that renowned photographer Carolyn Highsmith uh, set out to capture in images for the U.S. Library of Congress about five years ago. I'm proud to say I worked with Carol on this project, not only in helping her get to better know our state, but also in writing the introduction to our book, Connecticut. It's an essay that describes in words 
the character of Connecticut Highsmith captured in her images. So what we'd like to do with this talk today is talk about what Carol and I came to believe is the source and nature of our state's unique character. That is, about what makes Connecticut, Connecticut. We all know it's a special place, but it's really hard to define it, but we think we've got a clue. To do that, I'm joined by a group of musicians whose voices you've already heard, uh, talented folks who, who got together with me several years ago to form the band of steady habits in the land of steady habits. And I want to introduce you to them. We are uh, down one person, our, our missing uh, person who is, who is side, COVID sidelined is Tegan Smith on the left. Next to her is her best friend forever and twin sister, not, but they are, they, they've sung together since they were children. Rachel Smith, um, over here on my far right, I suspect some or many of you know him, it's Duke York. He is uh, the bass player and he's the guy who in many ways is the glue that holds the band together. He's somewhat of an Eastern Connecticut legend, great songwriter, heck of a musician, curmudgeon, and <laughs> lots of other things. And next to him is Jeremy Teitelbaum, who by day is a brilliant mathematician and professor at the University of Connecticut, uh, a former acting provost, which is a, that's a big cheese job. He now is a big cheese professor of mathematics, and he uses those ratios and harmonies to do some of the best guitar playing and five finger banjo picking you will hear this side of the Mississippi. So, uh, that is the band of Steady Habits. Uh, any, any, um, if you listen very carefully, if there are any egregious mistakes, you will usually be able to trace them to the microphone right in the center of the room, for which I apologize. So let's go back now to those foundational Yankee farmsteads, whose owners answered Israel Putnam's call to defend embattled Boston after the shot heard round the world. In Connecticut, such places still number in the thousands, thanks to owners, stewards, who love their home's connections to the past, even as they tolerate their structural concessions to time and gravity, and as any of you who own one knows, also winter. Culturally, these old houses, stone walls, and ancient trees of Connecticut lie at the epicenter of who we tell ourselves we are. Plenty, independent, freedom-minded folk, afraid neither of hard work or of standing up for our rights. They call up a people at once both proud and restrained, eager to show in stone and clapper that they'd attain social standing, but anxious to avoid ornamental excess or prideful display. It's a good story, and we like it, not just because uh, the evidence for its historic reality surrounds us, but also because it's aspirational. It's a call to the present to emulate former virtues. Which one of us has not, at least once in our own lifetimes, at some moment of great national danger, uh, found inspiration in the memories of those determined Yankee Minutemen who answered freedom's first call to freedom, uh, who answered America's first call to freedom, many from the doorway of Connecticut home still standing. And here, using the congregational hymn we started with, is a poem that Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote to uh, celebrate the opening shots of the Revolutionary War. It's interesting, he called it Conquered Hymn, and many people for a long time never understood what the hymn referenced to. They thought it was in, in reverence of the people who died at Concord Bridge. It was all that, but it also was a reference to this hymn. By the rude bridge that arched the flood, their flags to Unfurled. Here once the embattled farmers stood and fired the shot heard round the world. The foe long since in silence slept, alike the 
conqueror silence sleeps, and time the ruined bridge has swept down the dark stream which seaward creeps. On this green bank by this soft stream, we said today of old his stone that memory may their deed redeem when like our sires our sons are gone. For all its reality, like all origin stories, the story of Connecticut's Puritan patriots is also part myth, and more important, only one chapter of a much longer Connecticut story. The Anglo-Puritan monopoly on the creation of Connecticut society lasted nearly 200 years, etching its values deeply into our cultural heritage. After English Puritan migrants settled their first plantations of Windsor, Wethersfield, Hartford, and Old Saybrook, wasn't old then, along the Connecticut River in the 1630s, Connecticut became a vast cousinage. Almost the entire population of the colony and then state consisted of descendants of the first 20,000 Puritans who arrived in New England between 1620 and 1640. They prayed together, cleared forests together, built homes and plowed fields and made walls together, they feared, friended, and then fought the native inhabitants together to take control over ever more land, all the while joining together in holy matrimony and vigorously obeying that biblical injunction to be fruitful and multiply. And multiply they did. The average Puritan family in Connecticut had eight children, and through these offsprings repeated intermarriages, it's an exaggeration with more truth than lie in it to say that by 1750, every Anglo-Connecticut was related. And I guarantee, I bet if we did a genealogy of the people in this room, we'd find you know, a lot of us are cousins. So be nice and I'll tell your uncle. But, but by 1818, when the state's first constitution disestablished the Puritan church as the official religion, other cultures, voices, ideas, and faiths had begun to add new color, flavors, and influences. These rubbed against, then augmented, and sometimes supplanted the old Yankee ways. First came the Irish and Germans to build the canals and railroads and work in the factory villages along Connecticut's fast-running rivers and streams. Really? F minor? Really, really? Now I don't have a capo. I do. <laughs> if that's the worst disaster, we're still lucky. That's all that means is that the rear tail light is out. We can still do it. One, two. A one, two, three.
consisting of Italians and Russian Jews. They were in turn followed by French Canadians, African Americans from the United States South, and more recently still, Puerto Ricans, Latinos, and Asians. All were responding to the push and pull of homeland misfortune and Connecticut opportunity. Each in their own way was shaped by and helped reshape bedrock Connecticut Yankeedom into something still the same and yet different and much more interesting. We are... A. I know that one. in so many different ways over time. It's a, it's a much more complicated song now than maybe 10, 15 years ago. But still important. And so they came. And as they changed Connecticut, Connecticut changed them. Everyone who lives in our state for any period of time is molded in subtle but powerful ways by its distinctively beautiful but challenging natural environment and the meteorological convergence zones that give us four sharply different seasons and constantly changeable weather. Mark Twain, who wrote his greatest works while living in Hartford, once said he counted 136 different kinds of weather in four and 20 hours. <laughs> he wasn't the first Connecticut to face the need to adapt to a changing climate. That privilege belonged to the Paleolithic bands that entered Connecticut more than 12,000 years ago as the Laurentian glaciers of the last ice age slowly retreated northward. These, the true first settlers, were nomadic hunters who followed mastodon, elk, giant beavers, caribou, and other animals into an arctic tundra. As the climate warmed and the land began to host many of the trees, plants, and wildlife we associate with Connecticut today, natives settled into communities participating in seasonal rounds, changing locations several times a year to take advantage of the best hunting, fishing, or gathering opportunities. 
By 1614, the year the Dutchman Adrian Block became the first European to explore the river that gives our state its name. Connecticut's indigenous people had evolved into tribal groups with recognized languages, pottery styles, and <coughs> sharp territorial distinctions. Some of them had been growing corn on the rich alluvial floodplains of Connecticut for many centuries. Today, in the shadow of the world's largest casinos, owned by the Pequot and Mohegan descendants of those tribes, lie archaeological sites of their ancestors dating back more than 10 millennia. Here's a song from Connecticut's Mohegan tribe, an honor song to recognize the significant deeds of tribal members. settlers and all the immigrant groups who came after them has faced the challenge of making their way in a glacier carved and scoured land. Connecticut has a rich and a diverse geological history. The Appalachians, among the oldest mountains on earth, make up the northwest hills of Litchfield County. The state's distinctive track rock ridges such as Talcott and Avon Mountain and the hanging hills of Meriden were produced by lava flowing from rifts in the Earth's crust, created when the supercontinent Pangaea broke apart some 200 million years ago. These rift valleys provided the foundation of the Connecticut River Valley, the state's most fertile agricultural land. The southeast part of the state near New London was formed from Avalonia, once a part of the African plate. All these features were molded into the distinctive natural environment that is today's Connecticut by the intense glaciation of the last two million years. The most significant of which was the Laurentian ice sheet that began clawing its way through Connecticut only 26,000 years ago. At its peak, the glacier covering Connecticut was more than a mile thick and it extended 300 miles beyond the present Connecticut shoreline. By the time it melted out of the state 11,000 years later, it had completely transformed the land. The north-south grain of the landscape was accentuated, valleys were deepened, and hills rounded. The resulting pockets of lowland fertility, surrounded by stony, hard scrabble hills, help explain why the early settlers quickly hived off from where they had settled to new settlements, sister towns, four and five miles apart, at sites where needed pockets of fertile soil could be found. Connecticut today has 169 mostly small, mostly early towns, 144 of which still have fewer than 25,000 residents. The glaciers also carved out features that made ours a state of crystal lakes, vertical ponds, and long straight rivers, today as ever magnets for the people around them. Chief among all is the river the Indians called Connecticut, meaning the long tidal river. 410 miles from its source at the Canadian border to its outlet into the Long Island Sound in Saybrook, the Connecticut is New England's longest and most powerful river, with 148 tributaries and a watershed of over 11,000 square miles. It provides 70% of the fresh water that flows into Long Island Sound, greater volume even than the Hudson. 
Its daily tidal flow affects water levels 60 miles upstream, all the way to Enfield Falls above Hartford. Along with the river's outflow comes the sediment, and that sediment saved much of Connecticut's natural beauty. Silt deposits at the river's mouth created a massive sandbar that remained a barrier to deep draft vessels until well into the 20th century. As a consequence, Connecticut never developed a major riverine port like New York or Boston. And the lower river valley remains so pristine, the Nature Curve Conservancy has named it one of the Western Hemisphere's 40 last great places. Here's a song I wrote years ago and This river's been in my blood Since before I was born Rock and water and mud Wheat, hops, and corn Thank you. 
central to our economy, to our agriculture, politics, industry, and culture. The rich alluvial terraces first attracted maize growers, and then colonial settlers, then market farmers for New England's rising cities, and finally, shade tobacco producers. Visitors from other states who come to Connecticut are often surprised to see the long red tobacco barns next to the gauze-covered fields near the Connecticut River. <clears throat> and beside the road to Bradley International Airport. But the Great River, the early English people called the Connecticut the Great River, uh, offers a unique combination of soil, heat, and humidity, especially when you cover, when you make it shade tobacco, when you cover the stands with gauze, um, that produces some of the finest cigar wrapper tobacco in the world. For many years, shade tobacco was the state's largest single cash crop though today's locavore food movement has brought a resurgence of small farms to the valley, not to mention the business in growing another kind of weed, but <laughs> we'll see what that does. Shipbuilding, too, once flourished along the Connecticut. Deeper draft vessels, because of that sandbar, had to be ox-hauled over the Sabre Bar. They couldn't get out to sea without that. During the age of sail, the state's then abundant forests attracted shipwrights up and down the river. Most of the construction was for smaller, fast coastal vessels that plied the West Indian trade, taking food, barrel staves, onions, and horses to be exchanged in the Caribbean for sugar, molasses, and, yes, slaves. In wartime, however, those same fast, uh, small boats could be and often were converted into the armed privateers that preyed on enemy merchant ships. In 1814, a British raiding party attacked the town of Essex and destroyed 27 vessels, the greatest single loss to American shipping in the entire War of 1812. Hartford, 60 miles upriver from Sabor, was the first capital of colonial Connecticut. And although travel issues and inner city rivalry led to sessions of the General Assembly and, and therefore the capital moving, uh, they were held alternately at Hartford and New Haven after 1701 for 150 or so years. Hartford became the only capital in 1875. The decision on Hartford as sole seat of government came about as a result of a plan to build a new showcase state capitol building overlooking the prospering city's other new civic showcase, scenic Bushnell Park. When, after seven years of construction, the Richard M. Upjohn and James G. Batterson designed and built building was completed in 1878, all three branches of government moved from the 1792 Old State House near the river to the new Victorian edifice where state government has been centered ever since. <coughs> In marked contrast to today, Hartford was, when the new capital was built, one of America's wealthiest cities. Much of that wealth was generated by the great new industries made possible by the Connecticut River Valley's machine tool revolution. Samuel Colt's arms complex uh, at Coltsville, the Remington typewriter, uh, typewriter plant in Parkville, the Axe Factory in Collinsville, the Cheney textile mill complex in Manchester, and the Pratt & Whitney aircraft engine operations in East Hartford, to name a few, 
all evolved from the brilliant innovations in machine tool design that made the Connecticut Yankee a world-renowned symbol for technological innovation. From Putnam to Bridgeport, Waterbury to Vernon, uh, Rockville, Norwich, and all points in between, Connecticut factories and the hundreds of thousands of Yankee and immigrant workers who worked in those factories turned our state into a manufacturing phenomenon of unprecedented proportions. This industrial greatness rose hand in hand with the insurance industry that still is synonymous with Connecticut and the publishing industry that attracted some of America's best and brightest authors, including Twain, Harriet Beecher Stowe, and later the insurance executive turned poet, Wallace Stevens. Now, if the Connecticut River centers us, it also divides us. From the beginning, the settlers in the eastern part of the state have felt a natural orientation to Ward and an affinity with the metropole of Boston, while those west of the river have had interests more closely aligned with metropolitan New York. The differences that today are most clearly seen in the friendly sort of rivalries between Yankee fans and Red Sox fans. Uh, Yankees west of the river, Red Sox fans east of the river. Red Sox fans, welcome here. Were expressed two centuries ago not in fan rivalry, but in the violent exchanges between Tories loyal to the crown west and patriots east during the American Revolution. Of course, such predispositions are and were far from universal. There were plenty of patriots west of the river and vice versa. Still, those who know Connecticut well sense the very real differences between the quiet corner and the Gold Coast, between the Litchfield Hills and the last Green Valley. All Connecticut's, wherever they live, share a soul-deep appreciation for two things our state has in absolute abundance and in unusually close proximity, nature and culture. Even though we're the United States' fourth most densely populated state, with 742.6 people per square mile, Connecticut's original dispersed settlement pattern, combined with what's been amazingly widespread reforestation in the 20th and 21st century, let almost all of us live surrounded by or with immediate access to great natural beauty of immense variety. Ours is a state of sun-drenched summer beaches, aching red and gold leaf forests, rail beds turned hiking trails, bubbling trout streams, steep mountain paths with stunning vistas, sculpted parks, beaver ponds, and of course, the stone-walled fields and byways that let one and all know they really are in New England. It's astonishing to me how close all of these wonderful, natural, beautiful things are to interstates that sometimes resemble parking lots, right? It's just, it's unbelievable. Although our state's natural beauty is breathtakingly evident in every season, at no time is it more beautiful than in the season we're in right now, the one people come from the world over to share with us. Uh, I'm speaking, of course, about fall. And here's a song that uh, actually captures fall in New England, I think, better than anything. And I, I have to share something with you. I, I have been, since birth, a little bit colorblind. I don't know how much because I don't know, you know, I know I've always presented how people can see, oh, that bird up in that tree has got a red eye. And I'm like, where's the bird? So, <laughs> well, I had heard, and of course YouTube knows everything, I'd heard about these corrective lenses you can get that let even colorblind people see color. So I saved up for a long time because they ain't cheap. And I bought a pair. And today, driving here, I took these glasses. Where do you see how cool I look in them? <laughs> Roy Orbison has nothing on me. I put these on. 
and I, I drove looking at the trees. <clears throat> Excuse me. Just spectacular. And I've never seen it like that before. Is that right? Wonderful. How wonderful to live here. You know, there's only one other place in the world that has, a, a, and I don't know why, but there's only one other place in the world that has autumn foliage as beautiful as New England, and that's North Korea. It's because of climate and temperature. So, but I don't think until, until this day I really realized just how wonderful it is. So, as soon as we get home, I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to take the long way home. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. Um, no.
Miller, who would do it this way. Every time we do this song, we get to that last line, I want to do a Mitch Miller thing and raise my arms and go, when fall comes to do it. As you see, I can't get carried away. <clears throat> Within, among, and around Connecticut's profusion of natural wonders are the cultural treasures of a people who value ideas find inspiration in art and theater, are moved profoundly by music and dance, and who center themselves in the present by immersing themselves in the past. Connecticut's built the nation's first public art museum, the Wadsworth Athenaeum in 1843, and its first publicly funded park, Hartford's Bushnell Park, in the 1850s. It established the third oldest university in 1701, and Yale continues to rank as one of the world's leading educational institutions. The Connecticut Historical Society, founded in 1825 as one of America's first historical societies, helps assure that those charged with creating Connecticut's future are informed by the ideas and artifacts of our past, just as you do, and so many of you in this room have done with your lives. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. And the 1877 Goodspeed Opera House still introduces the world to classics of musical theater, such as Annie, Shenandoah, and Man of La Mancha, all of which first came to life on its stage. It might be said that each of the above-named institutions is ancestor to the literally hundreds of museums, galleries, theaters, and concert halls, like the Burden Historical Society, whose collective promotional efforts uh, help make our state one of the richest cultural environments in America. As Connecticut's, and this is this this I think is what Carol Highsmith and I came to see is is really at the heart of the uniqueness of this state. We love culture because it's in our nature. The two, the two live together in a very special way in this state. <laughs>
Jesus and the world will be better for this that one man scorned and covered with scars still strong with his last ounce of courage to Rachel's song has notes that go from Connecticut halfway to the moon, and she hit them all. Pretty wonderful. I'll get back to where I was. There we are. This wonderful state, this Connecticut, whose many rich, deep, and profoundly moving resources of nature, culture, history, and innovation, I've only touched on in this talk, were captured in images in a very special way by the remarkable eye of Carolyn Highsmith. Now, you can see many of them in our book, if you can find our book, Connecticut. Um, but more important, and this is what is really remarkable about this photographer in this stage where everybody seems to be about making the most they can make. Every single image she has taken in her collection is available on the Library of Congress Carol M. Highsmith Collection website for free. If you're looking for a great picture to use in a brochure in an ad, Carol M. Highsmith Collection, I do it all the time. It's just amazing and what a what a gift for the people of Connecticut. It's, it's uh, quite wonderful. The story her pictures tell is our story. The story of a people from another time who left their mark on land, home, and society, who lived in a place where geography, history, and time itself gave them a special relationship to nature and culture, a relationship that was written on their and in our souls. Whenever you wonder what it is that connects you so deeply to Connecticut, this land, its culture, its people, I suggest you remember or get on the web and go visit those images and their stories. When you do, I think what makes Connecticut will all become clear to you, clearer than words can say. I do love this song. What a closer. <laughs> Join us.
is so wonderful for you to invite us in, and so wonderful for you to come out today. Um, I hope, despite the broken tail light and, and the other stuff, you had a good time. It certainly is so nice to be back in business. It's been it's been a hard two years that COVID. So let's keep going. Thank you so much.